I punch tank every hour on the hour, 24 hour, and the process in a whole year long. If you're into traditional art like paintings and drawings, then performance art might take you by surprise. It can get really bizarre, so much so that some performance artists push things to such extremes, like refusing to sleep for a whole year, all in the name of art. Today we're diving into the world of an artist who will probably leave you wondering how far a man is willing to go for the arts. So he never slept for longer than about 50 minutes. He never left the apartment for longer than about 50 minutes. And what we see here is the documentation of that performance. Teiching Xie. Teiching Xie, also known as Sam, is a renowned artist famous for his intense and mentally challenging performance pieces. His work has garnered him acclaim in the art world, earning him the title of master from fellow performance artist Marina Abramovich. Xie's commitment to exploring the boundaries of endurance and time has made a significant impact on contemporary art. Early Life Sam was born on December 31, 1950 in southern Taiwan as the eldest of 15 siblings. Though he loved reading and exploring the works of philosophers and journalists, formal schooling didn't appeal to him, and he left high school at 17. By then he was fully dedicated to art, delving into the work of various creators and experimenting with painting. Yet, after completing his three-year mandatory military service, Sam's artistic path shifted. He moved away from painting and began creating what he called actions, physical and performance-based art pieces that pushed boundaries and left audiences guessing. In 1973, he performed his first of these actions, Jump Piece. For this, he leaped from a 15-foot, two-story building in Taiwan, breaking both ankles on impact. Sam gave almost no explanation for why he did it, leaving people to find their own meaning. This lack of clarity became a signature of his work. Each piece felt loaded with deeper ideas but remained open-ended, allowing people to draw their own conclusions. While not every performance involved such physical risk, his works consistently left audiences questioning what they had witnessed, challenging them to engage with the mystery. Performing such stunts in Taiwan in the mid-1970s wasn't easy. The country's conservative culture posed many obstacles to his unconventional style, making it difficult for him to fully express himself. Driven by a desire to find a more open environment for his art, he began searching for a place where he could work without restraint. New York City, with its diverse art scene and reputation for experimental expression, soon became his goal. Sam felt he could find the freedom there to explore ideas that were too challenging for his homeland's cultural climate. Before we continue, there is a topic that needs to be discussed. This image created controversy on the internet. Many people claim that this artist had not slept for one year, which resulted in this. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. The new journey begins. To reach New York, Sam took an unconventional path. He trained as a sailor in the early 1970s and in 1974 joined an oil rig bound for the U.S. But rather than finishing the trip, he jumped ship in Philadelphia, making his way to New York with hardly any money, no visa, and likely no ID. Arriving in the vast city, he felt entirely lost. Perhaps he had imagined New York as smaller or easier to navigate, but finding the right areas for his art proved to be a daunting task. Years later, he shared with The Guardian, when I got to New York, it took me two years to find Soho. I was illegal and afraid to take the subway. I only knew Washington Square and people doing portraits on the street. I didn't know this art scene. So he didn't dive into the art world as quickly as he'd hoped. Instead, he spent several years working as a waiter, dishwasher, and cleaner just to survive. It wasn't until 1978, four years after his arrival, that he initiated his first performance piece in America. This marked the beginning of his one-year pieces, a series of five projects spanning from 1978 to 1986. Each of these one-year pieces is compelling and deeply thought-provoking. They reveal Sam's relentless commitment to exploring boundaries and questioning the nature of art and life. His pieces were radical, rigorous, and some say extreme, yet each was unique, reflecting a dedication to art as a transformative process, challenging both himself and his audience. The first of these pieces, for instance, showcased an intense focus on routine and discipline, while others pushed the limits of isolation, confinement, and endurance. 
Exploring each of these works unveils a mind devoted to pushing art into uncharted territory. So, let's dive into these pieces one by one, because, as you'll see, some of them are absolutely mind-blowing. The Cage Piece On September 29, 1978, Sam locked himself inside a small, makeshift wooden cage, furnished only with a basin, a pail, and a small bed. He committed to staying in that cage for an entire year, during which he wouldn't speak, read, write, or consume any media. Each day, a friend would visit to take away his waste, provide him with food and clean clothes, and document the experience by snapping a photo, but without speaking to him at all. To ensure authenticity, a lawyer named Robert Perjansky witnessed and notarized the entire process. Before embarking on this piece, Sam reached out to journalists and artists to inform them of his undertaking. This outreach led to occasional public viewings, where spectators could come and see him in the cage once or twice a month. Despite these efforts, the piece didn't garner much attention in New York's art world, receiving only a few small articles. However, Sam remained undeterred. If anything, he felt inspired to push his performances even further and delve into more intense ideas. His commitment to the work and the extreme solitude he embraced became a crucial part of his artistic identity. Though the initial reception was lukewarm, this experience laid the groundwork for his future endeavors, revealing a determination to explore the depths of human experience and challenge the limits of art. Time Clock Piece From April 11, 1980 to April 11, 1981, Sam undertook one of his most grueling performance pieces. For an entire year, he punched a time card every hour on the hour. Each time he punched in, he also took a photo of himself next to the clock, having shaved his head at the start of the year and allowing his hair to grow out as a way to visually mark the passage of time. While the concept may seem straightforward, executing it was a nightmare. Sam was deprived of any real sleep because the moment he punched in, he had to prepare to do it all over again in just 60 minutes. Even the precious minute or two it took to punch in, set up his camera, and don the same jacket for every photo was a struggle cutting into the only real time he had to rest and recharge. At the end of this arduous project, he created a six-minute video showcasing a time-lapse of every photo taken. Though he missed the exact hour a few times, the video still contained over 8,600 images, capturing not only the gradual growth of his hair, but also the increasing defeat reflected in his facial expressions. This powerful portrayal serves as a testament to a man who sacrificed a year of his life for a singular concept. Every opportunity for socializing, creating, conversing, or even sleeping was replaced by the relentless ticking of the clock, a constant reminder of the passing time and the demands he had placed upon himself. Sam described his project succinctly, My piece one year, performed 1980 to 81. I punched in for every hour on the hour, 24 hours a day, for a whole year. The subject is about time. Every piece in the beginning or the end is about the most difficult part, sleeping. I had to wake up every hour on the hour, punch in, and then wait for the next hour. So basically, life became waiting for the next hour. This statement encapsulates the haunting reality of his experience. It's honestly a frightening concept, and one can only imagine the profound mental fatigue that such relentless sleep deprivation and monotony could inflict on a person. The toll it took on his psyche must have been immense, a constant battle between his artistic ambition and the basic human need for rest and connection. But Sam wasn't finished. If anything, he was just getting started. This grueling experience laid the foundation for his next piece, where he would push the boundaries even further, raising the stakes yet again in his unyielding quest to explore the depths of human endurance and the nature of time itself. Each performance was a new chapter in his artistic journey, and audiences eagerly awaited what he would undertake next. The Outdoor Piece From September 26, 1981 to September 26, 1982, Sam made a vow to spend an entire year outside in New York City. This meant he couldn't enter any buildings at all, not even cars, boats, planes, or tents. He essentially wandered the city for a whole year with nothing but a sleeping bag, without access to transportation, healthcare, or any kind of shelter. 
Without proper facilities, shopping for supplies or maintaining personal hygiene became monumental challenges. Even if a kind stranger offered him money, it wouldn't stretch very far, likely just enough to buy food from a street vendor. It's worth noting that the winter of 1981 was one of the coldest New York had seen in years, so navigating the city this way must have been incredibly tough. The harsh weather conditions compounded the difficulties he faced daily. There's an amazing gallery of photos documenting this project that can be haunting to look at. The grim nature of these images creates a fascinating time capsule, and the more you examine them, the harder it is to believe that Sam actually went through this. Yet he did. However, there were a few hiccups along the way. The only time he entered a building was when he was arrested for vagrancy. Fortunately, the judge showed sympathy upon learning about his artistic vow and released him right away. In later years, Sam didn't share much about why he felt this way, but he did mention that this was one of his least favorite pieces to perform, not because of the harsh conditions, the lack of resources, or the arrest, but simply because he couldn't clean himself. The reactions from people he encountered added another layer of stress to the experience, as he faced both curiosity and disdain from passers-by. While it seems he could have offered some fascinating insights about this experience, he mostly left it up to interpretation. The ambiguity surrounding his thoughts on this piece invites audiences to reflect on their perceptions of homelessness, survival, and the nature of societal engagement. Still, it was a captivating performance, raising important questions about the human condition. And his next endeavor promised to be just as intriguing, continuing to challenge himself and push the boundaries of art in ways that would resonate with both him and his audience. The Rope Piece the rope piece was performed from July 4, 1983 to July 4, 1984, and it stood out as the only one-year project that involved another person. This person was Linda Montano, another performance artist from New York. Together, they tied themselves with an eight-foot-long rope, promising to stay connected for the entire year. They also agreed to remain in the same room, never truly separating, and importantly, they vowed not to touch each other during the performance. Surprisingly, Sam provided an explanation for this piece, stating, I wanted to do one piece about human beings and their struggle with each other. We cannot go into life alone without people, but we are together, so we become each other's cage. Essentially, he aimed to confront his anxieties regarding social interaction and communication, and Linda Montano shared similar goals. As you might expect, the experience wasn't all smooth sailing, there were plenty of fights and arguments. Living in such close proximity under those constraints naturally led to tensions. However, amidst the conflicts, there were also hundreds of hours of conversation, allowing them to explore their relationship and the dynamics of human connection. By the end of the year, they had developed a strong bond, demonstrating that even in challenging situations, meaningful relationships can flourish. This performance, with its blend of struggle and intimacy, highlighted the complexities of human connection in a profound way. No Art Peace his final one-year piece was, in theory, the least grueling of all his performances, but it likely posed its own challenges for him. From July 1st, 1985 to July 1st, 1986, Sam vowed not to create or engage in any art at all. He wouldn't talk about art, consume art, or visit any museums or galleries. For someone who had finally found a community of like-minded individuals to share his passion with, this was a significant challenge. Interestingly, this performance or non-performance was not documented at all leaving much to speculation about his thoughts and feelings during this period. It marked a stark contrast to his previous endeavors, foreshadowing his next piece, which would be the complete opposite of this commitment. While this year of silence in art might have felt like a retreat, it ultimately paved the way for his next artistic exploration, emphasizing the continual evolution of his creative journey. Private Art Pieces and No More Art by 1986, Sam had completed his five one-year pieces and decided to take on something much bigger. On his 36th birthday, New Year's Eve 1986, he announced that he would create a variety of different artworks for the rest of the century. 
This ambitious 13-year project would culminate on New Year's Eve 1999, during which time nobody would see any of the pieces he created. After this period, he chose to keep these works private, adding an air of mystery to his artistic intentions. On January 1st, 2000, he declared that he would never create art again. He left us with a final message that simply stated, I kept myself alive. I passed the 31st of December, 1999. And that was it. None of the work he produced during that time would ever be shared. This decision marked a significant departure from his previous explorations in performance art. To this day, 24 years later, he has stuck to his promise, completely removing himself from the art world and leaving behind a legacy shrouded in secrecy. His choice invites reflection on the nature of creation, presence, and absence in the artistic journey. Legacy it's been two decades since Sam stopped creating art, and over 40 years since he began his first of five one-year pieces. While his later works were kept private and never seen, his earlier performance pieces were documented and eventually gained significant attention. Many performance artists have cited him as a major inspiration for their own work, underscoring the impact he had on the art community. In the 2000s, long after he finished his performances, people started to take notice. Articles, think pieces, and an outpouring of praise began to surface, leading him to attend various exhibitions showcasing his past work. Journalists have tried to interpret his art, suggesting it touches on themes like war, poverty, politics, existentialism, nihilism, greed, homelessness, capitalism, and more. However, in Sam's own words, his work really comes down to the concept of time. When you visit his website, the first thing you see is a quote from him. Life is a life sentence. Life is passing time. Life is free thinking. His early life reflects this idea. He dropped out of high school, spent years in the military out of necessity, and struggled to find his place upon arriving in New York. By all accounts, he felt he had wasted a lot of time, and his earlier works expressed this sentiment in detail. He emphasized that his art doesn't stem from a desire to suffer or be in pain, even if those experiences occurred along the way. Ultimately, his body of work leaves us with the image of a ticking clock, a reminder that time continues on, an unrelenting march that will keep ticking long after he is gone. This notion resonates deeply in his performances, capturing the essence of existence itself and inviting viewers to reflect on their own relationship with time. But Sam wasn't the only one who took art in an insane way. Here is another person who took the art in a more dangerous way than Sam. Wafa Bilal Wafa Bilal is indeed a provocative artist, and his statement about giving himself PTSD through his work highlights the intense psychological impact of his creative process. His art often delves into themes of conflict, identity, and the personal toll of war, reflecting his own traumatic experiences. By engaging deeply with these subjects, Bilal not only confronts his own history, but also invites viewers to engage with the emotional weight of such experiences. Early Life Born in Iraq in 1966, Bilal's early years were shaped by war and political turmoil. As an adult, he created art that criticized Saddam Hussein's regime, which resulted in his arrest and torture in 1992. Following this harrowing experience, he relocated to America, where he now teaches art at New York's Tisch School of the Arts. Given his brutal beginnings, it's no surprise that his artworks often reflect extreme themes and emotions, serving as a powerful commentary on his past experiences. Through his art, Bilal channels the pain of his history into a thought-provoking exploration of trauma and resilience. Attaching Metal on Head In 2010, Wafa Bilal underwent a radical body modification, having a metal plate attached to the back of his head secured by three metal pins surgically implanted beneath his scalp by a body modification artist. This metal plate housed a camera that took a photograph every 10 seconds, broadcasting these images to a dedicated website, complete with his location via a GPS tracker. The ambitious goal was to have the camera streaming images continuously for an entire year, providing a glimpse into his daily life and experiences. However, after just three months, Bilal began to suffer from constant pain, and his body started to reject the implants. 
Despite these challenges, he persevered with the project, opting to keep the camera attached to his head while having the infected part of the implant removed. This experience not only highlighted the physical toll of his artistic endeavor, but also raised questions about the relationship between art, technology, and the human body. Bilal's commitment to his work, even in the face of significant discomfort, underscores the lengths he is willing to go to explore themes of surveillance, identity, and the impact of technology on our lives. Domestic Tension His most extreme work is his 2007 piece called Domestic Tension. Wafa Bilal set himself up in a small living space at the Flatfile Gallery in Chicago, which included a bed, a computer, an exercise bike, and a small lamp. More importantly, it was equipped with a webcam broadcasting a live feed to his website 24x7 and a turret-mounted paintball gun that viewers could operate through the internet. While Bilal was confined in this space, he was bombarded with paintballs at all hours. The work aimed to recreate the feeling of being in a war zone, capturing the constant threat of being shot and the relentless sound of the paintball gun. It also explored the concept of hyper-reality, the disconnect between a person shooting someone on their computer screen and the reality of a human being shot in real life. This was particularly poignant during a time when unmanned Western drones were dropping bombs on Iraqi villages, piloted by someone safely seated at a computer far removed from the conflict. What began as a completely white gallery space quickly became a chaotic canvas, covered in sticky yellow paint. The images don't capture the full sensory experience. The paintballs were filled with fish oil, creating a greasy mess that reeked. Moving around the room, even if you weren't being shot, became an unpleasant ordeal. By the tenth day, the paint on the floor had thickened so much that it began seeping through an air vent into a storeroom below, where Bilal had his paintings. To combat this, he had to cover the vent with a towel blocking fresh air from entering the room and making the environment feel stuffy. The combination of the rancid air, the constant sound of the gun firing, and the tension of not knowing when it would fire next made it nearly impossible for him to sleep. The website was designed with a cooldown period between gunshots, but on the 16th day, hackers managed to override this cooldown and started firing at him rapidly, like a machine gun. This relentless onslaught took a severe toll on Bilal, leading him to develop PTSD-like symptoms, including insomnia and nightmares. If he did manage to sleep, he often experienced difficulty breathing, tightness in his chest, and stomach pains. For 31 days, he remained in that room, only leaving to use the toilet or take a shower. The experience pushed him to the brink, as the physical and mental strain began to warp his sense of self. On the final day, he felt like a completely different person, as if he had spent a year there instead of just one month. The accumulation of stress, pain, and the sheer absurdity of the situation weighed heavily on him. Bilal emerged from domestic tension not just as an artist, but as someone who had truly confronted the visceral realities of violence and the emotional toll it takes on individuals. Through this work, Bilal forced his audience to grapple with the implications of their actions when faced with the distance of digital warfare. By blurring the lines between art and reality, he challenged viewers to reflect on their own complicity in violence, whether it be through the lens of a camera or the click of a mouse. Legacy He wrote a book about his experience called Shoot an Iraqi, and it's definitely worth reading. In it, you get the sense that the messages he received in the chat room from people operating the gun affected him just as much as the paintballs themselves. I mean, if you set up a gun and invite people to shoot you with it, you can't be too surprised if some of them are pretty hostile. However, it wasn't just the physical pain from the paintballs. It was the constant stream of abuse and the fact that these people were intentionally trying to hurt him. This created a strange psychological impact that really seemed to get under his skin. The anonymity of the internet allowed individuals to express their aggression without accountability, amplifying the emotional strain on Bilal. The combination of physical and emotional stress made the whole experience even more intense for him. In Shoot an Iraqi, he delves into these complexities, examining how the intersection of art, violence, and technology can create a powerful, albeit painful, commentary on the human experience. 
Through his words, readers gain insight into the mental toll of his work and the broader implications of engaging with art that confronts societal issues. If you think Wafa Bilal pushed the boundaries of art with his dangerous performances, wait until you meet our next artist, whose work will undoubtedly challenge your perception of sanity itself. Chris Burden Chris Burden was born in Boston in 1946 to Robert Burden, an engineer, and Rhoda Burden, a biologist. He spent his childhood in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as well as in France and Italy. When he was just 12 years old, Burden had to undergo emergency surgery on his left foot after a serious motor scooter accident on the island of Elba. This surgery was done without anesthesia, and during his lengthy recovery, he developed a strong interest in visual art, especially photography. Burden studied for his Bachelor of Arts in Visual Arts, Physics, and Architecture at Pomona College from 1965 to 1969. He then went on to earn his Master of Fine Arts, MFA, at the University of California, Irvine, from 1969 to 1971, where he learned from notable teachers, including Robert Irwin. The Five-Day Locker Piece Another artist who put himself in a tough situation was Chris Burden. For his master's thesis in fine art at UC Irvine in 1971, he performed a piece called the Five-Day Locker Piece. Each student at UC Irvine was given an empty classroom to display their final art projects, but instead of focusing on his own space, Burden became intrigued by a row of lockers outside his classroom. In the week leading up to his performance, he mailed invitations to his art professors and classmates, inviting them to see his project at Room 167, Locker 5. Then, at 8 a.m. on Monday, April 26th, he climbed into Locker 5, which was only two feet wide and three feet deep. His wife padlocked the door from the outside, leaving him in a tight space where he could only sit hunched over or lie curled up in a fetal position. Inside the locker, there was a five-gallon water container above him that he could drink from through a tube. Another tube connected to an empty container below him to collect his urine. To avoid needing to pass solids during his confinement, he had starved himself for several days beforehand. He stayed locked in there until 5 p.m. on Friday, April 30th, five whole days later. There aren't many pictures of this performance, mostly because it was just a locker. One photo shows Burden's wife feeding him fruit juice through a slot in the locker door, giving a sense of how cramped the space was. As the days went by, he began to experience severe cramps in his legs and had to take muscle relaxants. Doctors were worried about the risk of blood clots from lying in the same position for so long, which added an additional layer of concern for both Burden and those monitoring his condition. As time wore on, the psychological effects of being confined began to weigh heavily on him. He became very anxious about his vulnerability. As word spread about his performance, random people started stopping by the locker to talk to him. Burden became fixated on the fear that someone might try to hurt him and that he wouldn't be able to defend himself. The confinement intensified his sense of isolation and heightened his awareness of the space around him, transforming the locker from a mere physical space into a psychological battleground. Ultimately, the performance ended without any incidents, and he emerged from the locker unhurt, a testament to his endurance and resolve. Through this extreme act, Burden made a significant mark in the art world, pushing boundaries and challenging notions of safety, vulnerability, and the human condition. Shoot and 747. And this wasn't Chris Burden's only extreme performance. Later that same year, he had someone shoot him in the arm with a rifle for a piece called Shoot. This shocking act was designed to explore the relationship between violence and art, pushing the audience to confront the reality of gun violence in a visceral way. In 1973, he took things even further with a performance titled 747, where he fired a pistol at a Boeing 747 filled with passengers as it took off from Los Angeles International Airport. The sheer audacity of this piece raised serious ethical questions about the boundaries of art and the safety of others. Then in 1976, he staged a performance called Do You Believe in Television? In this piece, he gathered a group of people and took them into an underground parking garage. There, he set a fire on the lowest level while the audience watched it on a monitor. 
The performance only concluded when the audience was able to put out the fire themselves, turning them from passive observers into active participants in the piece. These daring acts pushed the boundaries of performance art and showcased Burden's willingness to take extreme risks. His works demanded that viewers grapple with uncomfortable truths about society, art, and the lengths one might go to provoke thought and emotion. Exhibitions and Legacy In 2013, the new museum hosted Chris Burden Extreme Measures, a comprehensive exhibition showcasing Burden's work. This was the first major survey of the artist's work in New York, and his first significant exhibition in the U.S. in over 25 years. Burden has also had important retrospectives at several venues, including the Newport Harbor Art Museum in Newport Beach, California in 1988, and the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna in 1988-1996. His solo exhibitions include 14 Magnolia Doubles at the South London Gallery in 2006, Chris Burden at the Baltic Center for Contemporary Art in Gateshead in 2002, and Tower of Power at the Museum Moderner Kunst Stiftung Ludwig in Vienna in 2002. In 1999, Burden exhibited at the 48th Venice Biennale and at the Tate Gallery in London. Notably, in the summer of 2008, his impressive 65-foot-tall skyscraper made of one million erector set pieces titled What My Dad Gave Me was installed in front of Rockefeller Center in New York City. Chris Burden passed away on May 10, 2015 at the age of 69, just 18 months after being diagnosed with melanoma. His contributions to the art world, particularly in the realm of performance art, continue to be influential and are remembered by many. If you found yourself feeling perplexed or intrigued, that's all part of the experience. So, what do you think? Do you appreciate the chaos of existence that performance art invites us to confront? Or do you have questions about it? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more insightful content. Until next time.